In this portion of our Worldviews and Values class, we're now going to look at the thought of a 20th century American social theorist, theologian, and activist, Martin Luther King Jr. And we're going to look at two works in particular, and these are both short works. One is the Letter from a Birmingham Jail, and the other is the I Have a Dream speech. These are probably some of the most famous writings of King, who wrote a number of, of other things, including several books. Um, and the reason why we're going to focus on those in particular is because they're very accessible and... They contain a lot of the key themes of his thought in, in a very concise, consolidated form. Um, they also deal with some of the key themes that we're, we're used to looking at in this class, having to do with the nature of the human person, the nature of society, and the underlying reality in which both of those are, are grounded. So, um, as usual, we're going to look at the literary genre of these works first, and then we're going to talk about the historical context in which they're, they're written, and actually, uh, for one of them, spoken. And then we'll talk about some of the main themes that you, should, you could keep your eye out for as you're reading through this. When we turn to look at the literary genre of these works, they're really given away in the very titles. The Letter from a Birmingham Jail, the I Have a Dream speech. So that's the two genres that these fall into. And those bring up some, some important points. Both the letter and the speech are designed to be read in different circumstances and to work in different ways than, say, a you know, dense philosophical treatise like a discourse would be. Um, they're, not, they're not exactly dialogues either, although they have a sort of imaginary dialogue going on with them, with the reader, with the hearer. Um, they are very dramatic, and the speech particularly is, is um, rhetorically crafted, so you're going to see a lot of what we call rhetorical techniques built into it. There's also some, some really high-powered thinking going on in those. And so you have a sort of fusion of composition and, let's just call it philosophy, going on there. Philosophy that's focused on social matters. Um, now, one of the things that I want to point out in talking about these is that when we talk about rhetoric, one of the key elements of rhetoric is thinking about audience. And Martin Luther King is actually telling you in the letter who his original primary audience is. Uh, and, and these are not, you know, just everybody in general, but clergymen who are disagreeing with his, his tactics, with the things that he's doing, with the very fact that he's been thrown in jail. He's writing this from jail. That's why it's a letter from a Birmingham jail. Um, he didn't write it the way that we do on, you know, say a legal pad. He wrote it on the margins of newspapers and had, the, had it smuggled out and then, you know, composed later uh, and, and reprinted. Um, but he's writing to these clergymen. It's not, however, um, confined just to them. This is what you call an open letter. An open letter is one where you're writing to one person or one group of people or perhaps a corporation, but you also have a whole bunch of other people in mind that you want to read this and react to it and respond to it. So who are the people that, that King is writing to? Um, it, it includes other people in the civil rights movement, um, but it also includes people in, in the white and in the African-American communities, particularly in the South, who were opposed to the civil rights movement. And some of them are, you know, hardcore segregationists among, among the whites. Some of them are the so-called white moderates, who he talks about being very disappointed with. And some of them are African Americans who've been so beaten down that they've, they've sort of lost the sense that they could, in fact, stand up and demand civil rights. And some of them are those who are advocating violent uh, resistance to the, the, the segregation regime. So he has all of those people in mind with the letter from a Birmingham jail, and he names all of them in that work. I think you can also see the I Have a Dream speech as doing the same thing, but, you know, that one, it's, it's good to keep in mind that this is a speech that King is giving in front of a crowd of a quarter of a million people in the nation's capital 
with the eyes of the nation and the world upon him. So he's speaking for, um, you know, the, the civil rights movement, its aspirations, but he's speaking to people who may not be already convinced about that and trying to win them over. Um, now, the way that he wins them over is not just by saying, you know, some, some cool things that they might get, be able to get behind or appealing to emotions. It's to provide a, a, an articulation of an intellectual analysis and argument in both cases with some very deep ideas. Um, what we see going on in this is he's dealing with some, some crises of the moment. As a matter of fact, these are both um, from 1963, so they're in a relatively short uh, time frame. But um, he's dealing with perennial philosophical themes. He's, he's, he's framing these in terms of the bigger picture, which is why we're, we're looking at these in terms of worldviews and values. Um, He's outlining some of the key themes of his analysis of racism, of inequality, of nonviolent action, and of the goals of the, the movement itself. Now, one of the things that I do want to point out as far as genre goes about these pieces, the, the uh, letter from a Birmingham jail is very often anthologized in college textbooks. And it, 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 when I was in high school, it was something that we actually read and, and you know, went over. I was very surprised to find out uh, as I was teaching the current crop of students that very few of them had actually read the letter from a Birmingham jail because apparently it's not part of the high school curriculum anymore. And I think that both of these, these documents, the letter from a Birmingham jail and the I Have a Dream speech, are especially important for us to read in part because so many people make reference to them, and usually they refer to one or two lines from them, but they don't actually read them. And if you don't read these texts, you're depriving yourself of the experience of confronting thought that's emerging from a, a context of, of incredible um, struggle for civil rights uh, that are very articulately, very, very um, well thought out. And so it's important to actually read through these carefully, not to approach them as if we already know exactly what they're saying, civil rights good, segregation bad, but to look at the arguments, to look at, at what's being said, to look at the ideals that are being articulated in these. Let's talk now about the historical context for these two documents. And if you had to say it in just one sentence, the historical context for these two documents is that they are parts of a struggle against racism, against a particular kind of inequality in both the American South and America, uh, you know, writ large, in the 1960s. Um, now, the civil rights struggle had been going on for quite some time. King's involvement in it begins really in, in the 1950s and continues through into the 1960s, all the way up until 1968 when he's going to be assassinated um, after, you know, giving one of, one of his other major speeches, the I uh, had been to the mountain, uh, the mountaintop. Um, let's talk a bit about the historical context of um, the civil rights struggle, because it's something that I think a lot of people because it's so close in time and because it's been so publicized, a lot of people think that they know an awful lot about it, but um, they have sort of just, you know, a few pictures or flashpoints in their head. So what was going on? The civil rights struggle had been going on for a long time. We can say that it actually began before the Civil War, in part through the abolitionist movement, um, that it was carried out both by, by whites and by, by African Americans. You know, Frederick Douglass would be a, a prime example of that, um, writing in the North. And once the Civil War occurs and emancipation takes place, in the American South, there is a regime that's supposed to equalize things, called Reconstruction. 
uh, where, where the North, you know, has military troops in the South to try to enforce, um, say, you know, voting, uh, allowing African Americans to actually vote or in, enforce property, um, you know, and, and uh, other regulations that were supposed to equalize things. Um, it didn't last for very long. And, you know, there was already what we would nowadays call domestic terrorism going on, you know, with the Ku Klux Klan in the South and, and other movements as well. And what happens in the South is once the Union troops are gone, um, there's a, a resurgence of, of a racism that had never disappeared. And, and when we talk about racism, we should actually pause for a moment and think about what racism means in this context. So racism can be understood in, in terms of two different things that, that come together. There's other ways of understanding it that we'll talk about later. One of these is the idea that there are indeed human races. And this was coming out of the, the thinking and even the science of the 18th and 19th century. And it continued well into the 20th century. Um, you know, in, in a, if we look at modern day genetics, you can say that the, the, the idea of race as, as it's been played out in America or even in other places is really kind of a fiction. But a fiction that has had some extremely deep roots and an extremely, um, you know, wide impact upon the, the human race. Because we're all genetically compatible with each other. We're all part of one race or one species. And as it turns out, ethnicity is something very, very different. Um, genetic ethnicity is very different than what we thought it was. So for example, you know, if we talk about a black race and we're talking about sub-Saharan Africa, there's actually a lot of different genetic populations in there that can be quite different from each other. And the same thing goes for white or, you know, red or yellow or whatever you want to say. These, these populations don't break down so neatly. But a lot of the thinking of the time categorized the world into essentially colors, um, I suppose because colors were an easy way to categorize people, and, uh, or, you know, according to continents. Of course, you know, when it came to the consideration of what counted as white, it took a lot of time for the, the groups of people that we now consider automatically white, like, say, the Irish, to actually be considered white in the United States. But um, we've got this notion there of, of race, as races being distinct from each other, as being things that you can say have a kind of identity or an existence apart from the, the individuals. On the other hand, combining with that is a notion about a kind of hierarchization of races, uh, inequalities between them, and inequalities in terms of their, their propensities or their capabilities, and even more important, inequalities in terms of economics, in terms of who is free and who is not free, inequalities in terms of legal protection, uh, inequalities on a social scale, inequalities in terms of education. And you put those two together and you get racism. Uh, and along with you know, that is, is coming this notion that, well, the races, you know, for example, shouldn't mix, or one race should be dominant over another race. And this had such a strong hold over the South, but also over large parts of the North as well, as, as blacks made their way into the northern cities and in some of these great migrations, they encountered incredible uh, prejudice and, and racism, were, were you know, pushed into ghettos where they were effectively constrained there by the way in which um, the legal system worked, the way in which property worked, the way in which the economic system worked. Um, what was going on in the South was, was quite overt in many respects, um, and it was a regime that was, you know, carried out by brute force in many cases, not just social policy or, you know, people controlling the economics, but actual, you know, what we nowadays call, call terrorism. You know, the lynchings that took place in the South were effectively domestic terrorism. Terrorism is the use of violence to try to, you know, attain political ends, uh, generally to, to keep some group of people down uh, by scaring the hell out of them. That's why it's called terrorism. So this had been going on in the South for a long time. And there were, there were you know, 
times and places where African Americans were able to, to rise, able to build institutions. Um, I actually had the fortune to teach at one of those institutions in one of my previous positions, Fayetteville State University in North Carolina, second oldest university in North Carolina. It was founded by these, these seven men, um, all African Americans, who decided to create a school for African Americans, uh, primarily as a teacher's college. And uh, it continued on, and, and now it's part of the University of North Carolina system. Uh, it's known as a historically black college or university in HBCU. Um, and there were a lot of institutions like this. There, you know, there, were, there was the rise of a, a, a black middle class, as it was called, both in the South and in, in the North, you know, the Midwest and in Harlem and in places like that. Um, but they were always subject to, to you know, being taken down and to having their property destroyed or confiscated by whites who would be then protected by the legal system, uh, not prosecuted. And um, so their, their existence was always rather precarious. Now, that was supposed to change in terms of civil rights. And the NAACP had fought for a long time the legal battles that are really a, a you know, precursor to the civil rights struggle. So we see important you know, cases like Brown versus uh, Board of Education or Plessy versus Ferguson, which are saying that you know, the, the regime of segregation, of you know, maintaining these strict separations of, of whites and African Americans in the South were actually against the American Constitution. They were detrimental to American society. They were detrimental to the people who were being affected by them, especially those upon whom the brunt of that fell. Um, but the problem was these, these requirements to desegregate, to integrate African Americans and whites within the same society were not being followed. There, were, there was a lot of heel dragging. There was a lot of, well, you know, we'd love to do that, but we don't have the money, and we're spending the money over here on something else. Um, and there was a lot of, you know, two steps forward, one step back going on. And so that is part of what gave rise to the civil rights struggle. Um, you'll remember that one of the, the defining moments of that in the 1950s is the bus boycott, which is, you know, sparked originally by Rosa Parks saying, I'm not going to give up my, my spot on the bus to some white guy who's telling me to, you know, to get out of my seat. That was part of the custom of the time. Whites were being given a good treatment. Blacks were being given as bad of a treatment as possible. And this is a matter of course. And so African Americans stood up against this and said, we, we've had enough. And they were taking a lot of risks by doing that. Um, now, one of the other things that, that's important to think about in the context here that King actually mentions in the letter from a Birmingham jail is that we see in the 1950s and the 1960s um, all sorts of movements happening overseas that are aimed at attaining equality, at attaining justice, at attaining freedom for the, at that time, you know, colonized and oppressed peoples of Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, South America, all over the place. So, you know, white racism, you know, putting the, the, the sort of um, white Europeans at the top of the pyramid and having them be the ruling class, um, sometimes even just restricting it to, you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, if they could, they could pull that off. Um, that was breaking down all over the world. Colonialism was in retreat. Um, people were attaining freedom, uh, the, the capacity to decide for themselves. Um, it was becoming clear that the, the old justifications for this sort of regime were breaking down the so-called white man's burden. It uh, didn't turn out to be a, really a burden for the whites, but rather for everybody else in, in these areas. And so, you know, people like Martin Luther King and all the other people in this, this nonviolent uh, resistance movement and even in other movements were saying, why is that happening over there but not here in America? This is supposed to be 
the most prosperous country on earth. This is supposed to be a place that cares about freedom. It's in the declaration that, you know, all men are created equal, that they have these unalienable rights. Why isn't this sort of thing happening here when it can happen over there? when you know they can kick the the power structure out in these new african republics when you know france is getting out of these 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 colonies that they have and they've been administering um, because they're being booted out you know by pe by people fighting against them so this is a very powerful um, question to ask and it's a very timely one uh... in the nineteen sixties when when these two documents are, are coming about uh, Martin Luther King, it's worth thinking about his own biography as we read through these. Um, King was a, a person who grew up in the South and experienced the, the brunt of, of racism, saw all these things happening firsthand. Um, he had a father who was uh, unwilling to go along with, with some of these things and who, who protested from time to time against them. Um, father was also, you know, quite a disciplinarian when it, when it came to, to Martin Luther King Jr. himself. And um, he, he ended up sort of living through and reconsidering and changing his, his views on some of these things. At one time, he would not have considered himself somebody who would be, you know, ultimately a Christian minister, a Baptist minister. Um, but he had to go through a lot of soul searching, a lot of experiences, and eventually settle down on, on something as being, you know, the right thing for him, the right thing for his people, the right thing for the movement. Similarly with nonviolence, King was not originally, um, although we think of him as like, you know, the guy for nonviolence, he, he was originally for what was called armed self-defense. Um, but, you know, over time, he, he uh, was, was influenced by, by other people and then started, you know, looking at what Gandhi had done with nonviolent resistance in Africa. And there's this entire chain of, of thought that goes, you know, from King back to Gandhi, from Gandhi back to Tolstoy. And where is Tolstoy getting his ideas from? From the Sermon on the Mount and from, from this guy, Jesus Christ, who, you know, they're all being influenced by. So King is, over time, allowing these, these ideas, allowing these possibilities to work upon him, and then taking them and creatively uh, incorporating them as part of his, his response and saying, hey, you, you other people, you can do this, and we can all do this together as a way to, to fight against um, what's going on. So... Um, if we want to get more specific about it, these two documents are coming out of a context in which King, along with some other uh, religious leaders, had formed back in 1957 the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, uh, which was organized in part to fight against racism, to fight against segregation, to try to attain civil rights for, for all Americans, particularly for the exploited and, and uh, oppressed African Americans in the South. And they'd engaged in a lot of different um, protests. You know, by the time that King is, is arrested and goes to jail in Birmingham, um, it's not his first time. As a matter of fact, I think it was his 13th or so time uh, being arrested as a, a demonstrator, as somebody who's trying to work for civil rights. These two uh, works, as I mentioned, are coming out of one year, 1963. And in 1963, there is early on this, uh, this struggle that the, the Southern Leadership, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference had gotten involved in, in the city of Birmingham. Um, you know, Blacks were still not being granted their civil rights, not being allowed to vote, um, you know, not being allowed to do a whole bunch of things. The laws of the city of Birmingham were set up in such a predatorial manner as to try to exclude African Americans from every aspect of life. Um, what, what he actually went to jail for was a law that, that didn't allow you to have demonstrations or marches without a permit. And of course, they weren't granted a permit for the, the demonstration that they were doing, so they, they got sent to jail. So King is writing from a context in which he's, you might say, in the dungeon, in the citadel of the, the, the enemy. And he's arguing for the need not to treat um, the oppressor as an enemy, 
but actually to witness, to dramatize um, some, some higher calling. And he's writing to fellow ministers who were condemning him and the, the other protesters for engaging in law-breaking. So he's going into a very important exposition about the nature of law itself. The the other document, the I Have a Dream speech, is coming from the, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, which eventually drew a quarter of a million people into the Capitol, um, you know, to, to hear all these, these speeches. And King's speech is one of the centerpieces of that, that march. In it, what he's doing is he's articulating in a very powerful form the um, not only what they're struggling against, but what they're struggling for and how they're struggling for it. So this is all part of the, um, the literary, the historical context in which you should be reading these two pieces. What are the main themes that you should particularly pay attention to and try to frame things in terms of as you're reading through these, these two documents. Well, one of them is, of course, racism, the experience of what racism is like, which he talks about quite a bit, um, what it does to the human personality, both of the oppressed and of the oppressor, and um, why racism is fundamentally wrong. Um, racism understood as a, a irrational and arbitrary uh, form of inequality. Another key idea that, that King talks about is what you can call a network of mutuality. His idea being that injustice being practiced anywhere affects everybody in one way or another, directly or indirectly, and that correlatively those who become aware of injustice happening in another place have a duty to do what they can to try to bring justice where there is injustice. Uh, another key theme that you're going to see worked out in these is nonviolent resistance or nonviolent action as a response to racism, as a response to injustice taking place. And King is going to talk quite a bit about what the conditions for this happen to be. Um, one of those furnishes us with another key theme, which is that what he's trying to do is to dramatize the conditions. That means to produce something like a a human play in which you can see who the, the good guys are and who the bad guys are, and you can tell who the bad guys are even though you weren't sure about that before because they're the ones using force, aggression, fraud, and fear as their tactics against those who are standing up for justice. Um, another interesting idea that he brings out is what he calls creative tension. This, this idea of making things even tenser in a situation, but doing so in a creative way rather than in a destructive way, a way that is, is leading ultimately towards liberation. Um, another key theme that you should pay particular attention to is his discussion about just and unjust laws. What is it in a legal system or a system that's trying to impose order that actually calls forth our obedience, our responsibility. Um, it's, it's not every single law, it's not every single authority that we should be paying attention to. As a matter of fact, according to King, we should be critiquing and reacting to and trying to undermine some of them. Those that are just, we should, we should obey. Those that are unjust, we, we shouldn't. Um, along with this goes King's conception of personality as something that is inherently valuable, as something that can be damaged, even degraded and destroyed, or also can be promoted and uplifted. Um, this is part of how he makes sense out of the moral law that, that governs just and unjust laws. Um, another key idea is the very meaning of time. Is time something that we can count on to eventually bring about progress, or does it take human beings deliberately 
taking risks, deliberately putting themselves in harm's way, deliberately standing up to injustice and oppression in order for progress to be made? That's a key question that's being asked there. Um, along with that goes this conception of the um, power of, of love to transform things. King is an advocate of love as opposed to bitterness, as opposed to violence, as opposed to you know playing tit for tat and, and engaging in reprisals. Um, one of the other things that he talks about quite a bit is what he calls racial justice, which is the ultimate goal, a, a condition of harmony and integration between the races in which persons would be in fact respected as persons in which as he calls it in the I have a dream speech a condition in which the, his children or any of us would be judged by the content of our character rather than the color of our skin or any other arbitrary measure like the uh, you know the number of zero signs in our our, our uh, checking account or you know anything else along those lines content of character is what really matters um, he also talks about the American dream and the promise that is made in terms of the American dream he talks in the I have a dream speech about um, the, the you know the United States when it, it made its constitution and, and Declaration of Independence as having issued a check which has been bounced several times so far but eventually is going to be paid out. Finally, um, one of the, the last things that I want to bring your attention to is King's critique of what we can call a false position of moderation. The, the moderates that he's appealing to saying you're you're sitting on the fence saying slow things down um, you know I know that segregation is not a good thing and you guys have been oppressed but this isn't really the way to go about it King is saying that those people actually need to make a choice which way they're going to go so those are uh, some of the key theme key themes to keep in mind as we go through these these two works um, I think that gives you a good solid foundation for tackling these two that like I've pointed out a lot of people you know talk an awful lot about but you're actually going to be reading.